Okay, now the White House officials. So essentially, I was studying corruption and oversight. So what oversight committees exist to reduce the amount of corruption and waste that we see during the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Now, as a result of uh, prior kind of work experience that I'd had working in media, different political campaigns and so on, and with uh, my background in Twitter and things like that, and growing the social media, I'd reached out to somewhere in the ballpark of like 200 individuals seeing if they would want to be interviewed for my thesis. These are individuals I specifically looked for generals and White House officials, people for the National Security Council who are in charge of writing policy, people who worked for the State Department, the senior levels, all these individuals who might know a thing or two about corruption, as well as this group called the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, SIGAR. I'd spoken with those individuals as well and the directors for the Government Accountability Office. That's the office that oversees all corruption and waste for the US government. So I'd spoken with all these different individuals and had paired it with several hundred different interviews, like transcripts of different people uh, who were in charge of the war process. Transcripts that were released online, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, they were actually a lot nicer than I thought. Now, not to say they were good people, I'm not gonna go that far, some of them were some of them were genuine, very genuine people, and they, they spoke very frankly. And I'm going to watch my words, what I say now, because I had a contractual deal with my school and with them to state that I wouldn't provide specific quotes and I wouldn't paraphrase and attribute different statements to specific individuals uh, outside of the thesis itself. I'm trying to get the thesis published, but then there's like a, a contractual issue with the school and I figure out if I'm allowed to do that. But that was the caveat in order for these individuals to be willing to speak with me. They would speak very openly with me if under the condition that it's very limited to this, this type of work and in return, I would give them this uh, thesis once I'm done about corruption intervention, what I found, what US officials could learn from this type of thing. And I will make all different videos going into details about these things. I'm going to speak specifically about what it was like with these people behind the scenes. The specific details, what they revealed, what can I say more vaguely, what can I give you documents to affirming specific statements, all these types of things I'm gonna do in a different video because I don't wanna make this 100 minutes long and it's not really the time and place, frankly. So these people were smart, very smart. They weren't the smartest, for sure. They were nice, very serious individuals. Some of them were more focused on controlling the narrative, and that's what I found to be very interesting. Now, these might come across as no shit things, like, Zach, why are you even talking about this? You're wasting everybody's time because these are, are very vague statements. Obviously, this is going to be the case. Well, it might seem to be the case to you, but it's actually not necessarily always the case. It's fascinating. A lot of times, these guys who spoke very frankly but what's cool about these inner cool air quote cool about these conversations was what specifically they would take accept fault for and what specifically would they blame on other people and mostly they would accept the fact that corruption happened under their watch that was a big deal they said yeah 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 that happened i said why did that happen they said well because we didn't prioritize it corruption why didn't you prioritize it well because we we're focused on maintaining security relationships with individuals in the afghan and the iraq government and I'd said, well, wait a second, if people on the ground hate corruption and waste, or spe specifically people like, let's say Afghanistan, if people in Afghanistan hate corruption and these warlords use the money they're paid from the US to commit these atrocities, how did you not possibly think to overlook corruption if that's what's radicalizing individuals to join, say, the Taliban? And they said, look, we were under a timeline that was completely unrealistic. The Bush administration had created a timeline for when we're supposed to withdraw. He gave us a stack of cash. He said, you need to spend it because spending equals progress. If we don't spend it, then we are viewed as failing as a department. So we have to throw the money out there, say the money is spent, and then we have to get ready to withdraw. That created programs that were way too large for us to manage, us to be reliant on people in these countries that we shouldn't be relying on because we don't have the physical personnel in the country. And as a result of that, we can't look over these individuals all the time. And I said, well, doesn't that seem like a really, excuse my language, but doesn't that seem like a really stupid idea? <laughs> I don't know why I said excuse my language. I thought I was gonna say something worse, but I caught myself. I'm getting used to this media thing again. And they said, yeah, yeah, we definitely thought that that was not going to work to an extent. 
but they said we didn't actually think it was not going to work uh, for a few years down the line. It was about 2006, 2007 that some military personnel found out, about 2007. But then people who were in charge of like aid and giving like humanitarian aid assistance, this was in Afghanistan, excuse me, all the way back to about 2002, 2003, they said, yeah, we knew this right off the bat. We literally give people money and then they just spent it. And any sort of anti-corruption efforts were stifled by this thought that these people who are corrupt could still maintain security over the Taliban. And you might be thinking, well, Aren't they just pissing off locals and having them join the Taliban? Yes. Did anybody think of that? No. Does that sound ridiculous? Yes. Is it the truth still? That's also yes. And so the people that I'd spoken with, what was interesting was they were okay with accepting these different types of things because it was already known. We already know this. But what was interesting was that they would refute one specific fact about this situation, which was they had poor coordination with other agencies and as a result of that this coordination they became over reliant on these warlords when they themselves as individuals should not have been doing that and that might sound very specific very niche very weird but for some reason they were all very touchy about that and the reason is because one of the biggest issues that had led to the reliance on these different warlords was literally the fact that they didn't they there was a security there uh excuse me there was a a lack of staff that was an issue but a big issue with all in all of this as well was just the fact that like agencies like Department of State just sucked at coordinating with the the military and because that should be a theoretical issue that should be easily like uh, dealt with so t it sounds like a tedious thing but like relatively simple to fix they really didn't want to accept any accountability because that's one thing that you could point to and be like hey man Instead of paying a warlord to maintain security while you build this house, why didn't you just do a better job at coordinating with the military when they get into that region and then just have them take security while you build that house so you don't rely on the warlord? And that's what's very sensitive to them. So interagency coordination is what that's called. Now, if you want to know what specifically is going to happen in places like Ukraine, if there's a reconstruction there or any of these other places, Interagency coordination is going to be the number one American failure that's going to lead to a bunch of money wasted that we could have used for social welfare. Quote me on that. But anyway, most of these guys were pretty talk, pretty frankly, honestly, they really didn't care at this point what anybody thought except for that interagency coordination aspect. I, the military guys were obviously a lot more blunt. The guys who were in charge of developing uh, war policy for Iraq and Afghanistan, I give you more details, but I have to speak with uh, different like lawyers and so on and see what I can reveal. The Department of State guys were pretty cool as well. Everybody seemed to be relatively all right with speaking with me, and I think most of the reason is because there were at times where they're trying to control the narrative, specifically as it relates to what their role was. So, for example, we didn't do that. I myself didn't do that. That was sweet baby Jesus. The camera just cut out. <laughs> A lot of these folks though would say, we didn't do that. That was not our job. That was, uh, that was Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney's the one that made that policy. And that happened all the time, by the way. And that's probably relatively correct. But there are times where I would have to call them out and say, well, no, according to the documents, this was your specific job in, say, for example, the Department of State. You can't blame this on somebody else. But overall, people were very keen on blaming Cheney for everything. Essentially, within like the White House, by example, there was a, a general consensus that there was Bush and Cheney who did their own thing, and then you had all the other individuals in the administration who had all focused on developing plans. So a lot of times, these folks would develop plans, develop a specific idea about what exactly we should be doing, and then Bush and Cheney would ask very vague questions. Do you need help? Is everything going okay? And they would not accept no for an answer, or else they would get mad and maybe fire some people. But if you said everything is going okay, they wouldn't ask any additional questions. And I learned that inside the, the White House, they would do that intentionally. And the reason why they would do that is so they could limit their culpability. They could limit the amount that uh, the public could blame them. Because they could always fall back on, well, I didn't know that was the case. My administration didn't. They didn't tell me. And so that was something that was very significant to the Bush administration where they knew what to ask, what not to, because they knew things were going bad. But at the same time, they didn't want to be held to blame. That's very interesting. 
Oh, and by the way, Dick Cheney is exactly how you think. He's an absolute psychopath, and everybody inside the administration acknowledged that as well. Now, finally, we have the Afghan security personnel. I might actually get some uh, audio recordings if I can, or maybe get some statements from some of them. I had actually known some people from MSNBC, CNN, NBC. There's like a, a specific correspond, well, a few correspondents who worked for them in Afghanistan. He was kind of a contractor. And I'd reach out to him and he had gotten me in contact with these different officials, these different uh, special forces personnel who end up becoming Secret Service. And then we have to verify their I identity and we do that through different like pictures and you have to triangulate who they are and get some alibis, et cetera, et cetera. So we ended up doing this, it was a really cool project. Some of these guys, man, it's fascinating because I didn't know what exactly I would walk in on with some of these uh, special forces personnel, et cetera. It turns out like a lot of them, they were actually educated in the UK with a master's degree, which I was like, whoa, there's a master's degree individual who's also a special forces become secret service for the Afghanistan government. That's okay. First of all, that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating discovery. Like, <laughs> like what? And half the time I'm sitting there on the phone, like I can't, I can't even believe that this is like a reality right now. And uh, a lot of them couldn't get out, obviously, during the Afghanistan invade or the, the withdrawal, the U.S. withdrawal. They couldn't get out of the, the country. So a lot of them were stranded. We were speaking on different media platforms like WhatsApp and they would change their identity oftentimes. But yet they I would still stay in contact with them. They a lot of them obviously had worked in some way, shape or form with the CIA. A lot of them I would speak with when hear back for a while, receive a message from one of the other individuals saying, yeah, that person was killed. Here's his photo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of them were in prison for a while, somehow released because one guard was cool with them and then would release them. Some of them were held prisoner and were forced to train the Taliban to use different U.S. weapons you know, or else their family would be all mass unalived. So it was very, it was a lot of that. And I'm going to go into that a lot more in depth and provide a lot more uh, videos, like probably do a video series on this. So I want to give like a general idea about what this was like, kind of like a preface, preface, preface. I'm going to do like a little, little heads up that that's something I'm going to be doing. I want to do the justice on that though. So I want to kind of focus a lot more time and attention, but those people were very cool. Spoken with a lot of civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan as well. I, uh, I also spoke with a lot of oil executives in Iraq and so on. That was amazing to speak with them. Some prisoners of war as well. I will see if they want to want me to release some statements. That was a really cool experience though. Everybody was very nice, very cool, very chill. No, everybody was very honest. I was very surprised. All the politicians, civilians, everybody was extremely honest. The only thing they said was, can you validate our security? Can you make sure that we're not going to be unalived as a result? And so I had to meet with like specialists in these areas and now, okay, how do we make sure that I can verify their identity, uh, but also ensure that their security is, is good to go. I don't know why they were willing to speak with me, frankly. I think it might be because of my, my like social media pre pre uh, prevalence. No, that's not the word. Presence where they can actually read back and see like what I've ever posted, who I am, this, the, the work, etc. So a lot of people always talk about like social media being a bad thing, but that's actually a really important thing because if you actually are very careful with what you say and very intentional with what you say, which we're all gonna make mistakes, but generally speaking, then people can actually track who you are as an individual and then judge whether they wanna speak with you as a result of that. So that was really cool. That was a cool experience. And that was very gratifying and the, Afghan locals, man, I, I'd say they're some of the coolest people I've ever met in my entire life. They're always at, they always start with like, how are you? Before you get to any business, they're asking like, how are you? How are you doing? These types of things. Not in a, it's so much like an American sense where we just say it kind of reflexively, but they take the time to actually acknowledge kind of where you're at and how you feel first. It was a really cool experience, but those guys were fascinating and I'm still in contact with some of them. Some of them are still alive. There's the, they're telling me that there's a rise of ISIS on the ground there and a lot of the formerly trained US personnel uh, are joining ISIS, similar to in Iraq where a lot of those people joined ISIS. The people, not US trained, but the people that the US fought who were part of Saddam's regime ended up joining ISIS. But in Iraq, or excuse me, Afghanistan, it's people that were 
trained by the U.S. are now joining ISIS. So in both cases, U.S. policy led to the increase in ISIS. And you might be thinking, that sounds ridiculous, Zach. Afghanistan and Iraq are not near each other. Afghanistan is not even near Syria. Yes, you're right, but it's still a thing. You know, people can, in fact, travel, and it's a big deal right now. They're paying a lot of money, and I asked this guy, why would anybody join ISIS? And they said, well, because the Taliban's not going to stop unaliving our family, and so that's what we're doing. Now, I haven't spoken with anybody who's willing to join ISIS, but they know people who have joined ISIS, and that's the idea. They said, well, ISIS is terrible, but at least they're not going to unalive my family. It's like, yeah, man, I, I guess, but they're going to do all the, you know, videos that we see online. But their argument is, well, the Taliban already does that to us anyway. So that's intense, very intense situation. But anyway, I'll go into all of this in other video, video series, etc., etc. So I'm going to provide more detail. This is just a general idea about what I've been up to. So it's been a wild ride. Going back to the US, very excited about that. I have some ideas about what I'm gonna be doing. Well, I have plans, specific plans, what I'm doing when I get back to the US as well. I really wanna come back and make progress on the ground with all y'all. But uh, yeah, wild times.